thank you for joining us again on the Servant Podcast this week. We appreciate you participating with us and and being willing to sit down and listen to the Word of God as we we take it right from His Word. We don't we try our best not to put what we think, but we want to serve God as He wants us to serve Him. In September this month, we are talking about why should I serve others, and we have talked about what the world says about service in comparison to what Jesus, why Jesus served, and we know that it was out of a sense of love. You know, Jesus, again, real quick, this is Ethan Tate. I introduced him on the first episode. He's with me all month, and we are talking about this idea of why should I serve others. So we looked at Jesus, and and Jesus said something there in the book of Acts, Acts uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, that really just hits home with service. In verse 35 in the book of chapter 20 in Acts, it says, it is better to give than receive. So let's ask ourselves a question here. What are we here to give? Because with that idea of serving someone, we're, we're supposed to give something. We need to offer something to someone. So what are we giving to people around us and how are how is it affecting their life? So let's think about on this episode choosing the right path. Where should we go? We've looked at two options. We've looked at what the world has to offer and what Jesus has to offer. Which one will we choose? Which one will we be committed to? So Ethan, do you have some thoughts about this about choosing the right direction and how can how can we help others choose the right direction and what's our responsibility in with that as well okay so you're asking two distinct questions uh paul would have that kind of uh, mentality when he's talking about why why should we reach out to other people well it really goes back to the i think it's the first john four concept we love god not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul would talk about that concept in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 12, where he's trying to give a defense for his apostleship and why he continues to work with the Corinthians. He would say, we do not commend ourselves to you, but give an opportunity, uh, give you an opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. If we're beside ourselves, it's for God, or if we are of a sound mind, it's for you, for the love of Christ compels us. How does it compel you, Paul? Well, he says in a figurative way, we've figured this out so far, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer, note this, for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. So Christ came to serve. He came to serve all. And because of that, Paul would say uh, that moves us to see we need to be like him and serve him. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this? Well, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. So if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation the old things are past, all things have become new. Now notice down in verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. In fact, you notice verse 1 and following of chapter 6, we then as workers with him, with God, with Christ, plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he said, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul is saying, everyone is in sin, was in sin, or well, I mean, everybody's violated the law, is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So because we've come to that conclusion, guess what that compelled us to do? If God loved me enough to die for me, that also means he loved you enough to die for you. Mm -hmm. And since he's no longer here to continue in that work himself, he now has his hands, his feet, his body committing that service to help bring more souls to the kingdom. That's you and I in the church. That's Christians is what it is. So going back to that avenue of love, Paul would say it's love that has compelled us to want to do what's right because... That's the right thing to do. Right. And well, 
we talked about this and i believe it was last episode romans 10 we see paul's desire for israel not he doesn't want anyone to be lost and you met you made mention of um there in romans paul would have rather have suffered affliction for his brethren's sake so it, it does it deals with a sense of love for people and when we look at the word of god Paul says there in first, uh, second Corinthians nine, or maybe it's first, first Corinthians nine, verse 16. Woe to me. If I don't preach the gospel, that's it. Matthew six thirty three. seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. God wants his servants to have a spiritual mindset, not one day a week, not two days a week, not three hours a week, Every single, there's 168 hours in the week, and we should have a spiritual mindset 168 hours. And when we do that, we see a crucial part of life. There in Matthew 5, verse 4, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. I think the idea there, in which I, I say I think, but the idea is that those who have a mournful spirit towards sin, when, when we look at sin, if we're not bothered by that, then we have a bad attitude. That's right. And we should, we should want to be diligent to help people. We, I mean, God be thanked. I think, I think Paul says that in Ephesians 3, that when he was in sin, God's grace was showed him was shown to him that he should preach the gospel to the Gentiles there in Ephesians three, verse eight, eight through 12. That's the same mindset to us. We, like you were saying a moment ago, the sin debt was on all people and, and we were all condemned. We all stood condemned there in second Corinthians five, verse 21, it shows the relationship God wanted but he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we, you and I, those that want to follow Christ, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's a responsibility on us. When we've decided to become holy as he is holy, as he's told us in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, when we've decided to become holy, we need to become the righteousness of God. And we need to look at those who are lost with a mournful heart. We want them to be, to have what we have. We want them to be saved as well. So what are, what are some of your thoughts with, with all of that we've unpacked? You know, there, we're looking at choosing the right path. There are two paths. I think Paul says there in, in Romans 6. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a path we would like to go down, and there, well, another way of saying it, there's a way that seems right, but it's wrong, mm -hmm. and even maybe backwards thinking, uh, there's a way that seems wrong, but it's actually right. That's right. Um, hey, that's right. That's First Corinthians one. Yeah. So I mean, it, how do, how do we how do we guide our compass in that? Um, I believe in view of what we've discussed of the attitude Christians must have towards those who are lost. I like to think of it this way. You go back through the Old Testament. Why did God ever have to say anything to the children of Israel about the foreigners that were traveling with them who were not actually blood-born Hebrews? It was uh, danger. There yeah, was danger there. It was danger. It, it was also God told them, look, as you were slaves in Egypt, you were foreigners at one time. You accept these people under your wing. You take care of them. They must oblige to the law if they want to be pleasing to me and follow you throughout the day so that they may serve me. That same elitist type mentality of, well, we're us and you have no right of being a part of who we are. That mm. almost sounds like the Jewish mentality in the New Testament. That John is. chapter 7, when the guards came back to uh, talk to the, the Pharisees and the, the scribes, and they said, uh, we find no fault in this man. We would say, has he deceived you? Have any of the rulers believed in him? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Well, that's, that's not what's under consideration. The elitist view 
God is the highest elite there is. That's and right. he doesn't have that view of, well, you're not worthy to be saved. You're not worthy to be saved. He sent his son so that all might be saved. The characteristic we as Christians have to develop, have to develop, and it's not because, well, the Bible tells us so. Jesus did this. We should want to. Humility. Mm -hmm. I must humble myself. Paul would say to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 that he was the chief of all sinners. In mm -hmm. fact, he would say this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. There is no denying this is right, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. There's a lot of people in the world, and you know what? Right now, they might actually be serving as a God-given example of how mm. God can take someone of the world and turn them into one of the greatest proclamators of the faith. Paul is that prime example, the greatest mm -hmm. persecutor to one of the greatest um, proclamators, but it also had a great problem in the middle of that whole pr process. He had to learn humility. And sure. when he started to see, you know what, and Paul's not the guy to, to really mess with in view of saying, well, Paul, you're a nobody. He was more zealous of the traditions of his fathers than anyone else who came before him. Yeah. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a Benjamite of the stock of Benjamin. I mean, that that almost sounds like a, a prized animal at a, a, a farm or a fair or something. Uh, Paul is saying, look, I'm the best of the best there was. But God still said, you know what? I've got greater plans for you. That's right. Even in the same text, he would say, God, who took me from my mother's womb and saved me by his grace, has taken me so that I might profess the gospel of Christ to mm -hmm. the heathen. We need to find humility within ourselves. Fantastic if you're a child of God. That is terrible, awful abhorrent, horrendous, if you say, that's not my job to save the world. Mm. Ezekiel 3 is a wonderful chapter where God looks at Israel and he says, I've set you as a watchman. Mm. Um, if it comes to pass, you've warned people and they don't heed your warning, their blood won't be on your hands. That's right. But if you don't warn them, and I've set you as the watchman, and it comes time, they perish, they die, their blood's going to be on your hands. That's why in Isaiah 6, who will go for us? What did Isaiah say? Here am I, send me. Some of them aren't going to hear Isaiah. Their eyes are going to be heavy, ears dull of hearing. That's okay. I've got a message to speak. I've got souls to save. You're not going to save everyone. That's not our prerogative, our mission. Our aim is just to share the gospel because we love as he loved us. So when we look at that first half of the equation and how we should go about serving mm -hmm. others, choosing the right path, I've got to humble myself first. And even showing that, becoming all things to all men, mm -hmm. how do I win people over? Sometimes my attitude might be the cutoff, turnoff point for them, but I've also got to show them that I genuinely do care. That's going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of thinking, some preparation as I begin the preparation yeah. of planting the seed. Uh, and I got to keep my eyes open. And it, through that whole process, again, humility, humility. Why am I doing it? Because he loved. He loved. That's right. So, yeah, like you said, we looked at, there's two options here. Choosing the right path. If you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, if you've been obedient to the commands of Christ, then you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to preach the gospel to preach Christ crucified, that you might win some souls for him. And then those that are without Christ, you've got to choose too. We were all dead in sin at one point, and we had to make a choice. We had to make a commitment. So those of you without Christ, you have to, maybe you're riding the fence. Do I want to serve God? Something I used to say a long time ago in a past life, I, I used to say, well, I'll be a Christian later. It doesn't work. And I praise God that he, his son didn't come back at that time because I would have been lost. We have to look at the word of God and make a decision. 
And there's no better time than now. There is no time to waste. And the only way that we can make the right decision is look at God's word. I think about Psalm 119. You mentioned this a couple episodes ago. I look here at the, at, the, at the chapter heading, <laughs> the chapter heading, meditations on the excellencies of the word of God. This is the blueprint of this life. And there in first in first Timothy four, eight, it says that uh, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things in this life and for the life to come. We need to look at how to be godly. How do we be godly? How do we, how, how can we be godly, Josh? Look into his word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the only way we can have the best life. There in Psalm 119, maybe you're trying to make a decision. You need to choose. You need to choose the direction of your life. There in verse 105, it said, it, the psalmist there says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So which path are we choosing? We have to choose the right one. If we go back to verse nine, it shows us how to cleanse our way. It says, how can a young man cleanse his way? You got to take heed to the word of God. It's got, it's got all the practical advice that you need in this life. And, and sort of turning this over back into the best sermon ever preached, Matthew 5 and verse 7 there says, hunger and thirst after righteousness. How do we do that? We need to be starving for the word of God. There's no way, there's no way that we have enough time to understand every little detail of this book. God has made it easy to have a relationship with him though. And he's revealed to us hunger and thirst after righteousness means we need to starve. And Ethan, there's a lot of starving people out there and they don't know they're starving. They really don't. And they're seeking for some sort of fulfillment but the only answer, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed to the word of God? Absolutely. You look down at verse 14. I think this works with the, there are people starving in two ways. There, there's people who are constantly fighting to stop world hunger. Well, Jesus would say the poor you'll have with you always. Um, unfortunately, that's that will always be a problem. That's also, it's a bad problem because people are suffering. But it also, in another way, opens opportunities for God's people to serve and take care mm -hmm. of those needs, which is pure religion undefiled before God, James 1, 27 mm -hmm. following. So when you look at Psalm 119, I want you to notice verse 14. Uh, I've rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. That's good. You know, a big reason why... Uh, we might not be satisfied with serving God is because I've been preparing for my career, my uh, marital choices, uh, my home, my car, my clothes. I'm really trying to think about setting up for a good life so I can have a good retirement and all that. What about my eternal preparations? If I spend my entire life trying to work for trying to build up my retirement, how much am I trying to work on building up my eternal retirement? That's right. I mean, and even with that, how many other people, I mean, we go around and we might be like, oh, life insurance, life insurance. Well, what about soul insurance? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a one-time, that's, that is lifetime guarantee for the faithful child of God. And when I start looking at God's word in such a way of how beautiful and just how valuable it is, you think of the value of a soul in Matthew 6, God didn't array uh, in all the glory of Solomon, which his net worth maybe was about $2.1, $2.3 trillion. All the glory of Solomon is not even representative of the glory of a flower. And God cares more about you than that flower. Man, shows value. But notice as well, verse 15, I'll meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. ways. Mm -hmm. How can I best serve God in choosing the right path? Let's start with making God's ways my ways. That's right. That's right. And we're about out of time, but we need to choose, choose this day who we will be committed to, who we will serve. And the only way is to lay up treasures on, not on this earth, but we need to lay up treasures in heaven. 
it says there in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Verse 21 says, it's obvious where your treasure is. When you look at people, you know where their treasure is. We need to just be careful to choose where we're placing our treasure, where we're placing easy our to heart. Easy see commitment. It's, easy to see commitment. And you need to, and we need to be committed to others. We need to be committed to serving others in the way that they should they should go in this life and choosing that right path. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much again for joining us on the Servant Podcast. We appreciate you so much. We hope that maybe you this benefits you. And if you have any questions about whatever whatever questions that you can come up with, please make them known to us and we'll do our best and we'll study hard on them and we'll get you an answer from God's word. Thank you again for joining us. Join us again next week on The Servant Podcast.